So Dr. Peter Hotez is having a complete meltdown when it comes to a COVID symposium that is being put on by Stanford University. Um, let me just go ahead and show you what he's having. This is the meltdown that he's having. He's saying, my goodness, what's happening at Stanford? This is awful. A full-on anti-science agenda and revisionist history tone deaf to how this kind of rhetoric contributed to the deaths of thousands of Americans during the pandemic by convincing them to shun vaccines or minimize COVID. Now, if you remember, Dr. Peter Hotez is the, I, I would say is, or he was at least during the pandemic, he was the main voice on MSNBC. He was a regular contributor on CNN. He was the guy that they brought on to talk about the pandemic all the time. He was even featured on Joe Rogan's show at the very beginning of the pandemic. This is before Joe so, sort of started to change his mind about the COVID pandemic. And, you know, at first he's like, how serious is this? And Peter Hotez is like, oh, real serious. This is really serious. It's going to kill a lot of people. And a lot of people were listening to Peter Hotez in the beginning when he was really sounding the alarm, very alarmist about COVID-19. But then as the science started coming out and as we started getting data, we got data about the who was dying from the virus. We got data about uh, who the virus most affected, who the people were that um, what, what was going on with the vaccines when we got the vaccines. Well, Israel got the vaccines first. They started vaccinating their entire population. We saw that they did you know one round, then they did a second round. Then they were like, oh, this is not stopping the spread. We have to do boosters. And oh, that didn't stop the spread. We have to do another round of boosters. As that science came out, the problem with Dr. Peter Hotez is that he didn't change his messaging at all. And we saw this, especially in the liberal media with MSN, MSNBC and CNN, they didn't change their tune at all, no matter what the science taught them. As they were sitting there screaming, the science, the science, these people are all anti-science. They ultimately proved to be incredibly anti-science. And Dr. Peter Hotez was one of them. He was then challenged to debates by Steve Kirsch, offered him, I believe, a million, I mean, some like really ridiculous amount of money. I think it was almost a million dollars to that would go to his charity of choice if he would just debate Steve Kirsch and Peter Hotez wouldn't do it. He wouldn't debate anybody. He wouldn't have a conversation with anybody. And here we are in 2024, and he is still quadrupling down on the fact that, you know, he thinks that his messaging was correct and that everybody else is spreading dangerous misinformation. He goes on in this thread and he says, um, the program indicates the new Stanford president will headline the symposium. While I'm all for free speech, this type of anti-science aggression doesn't have to be promoted by the Stanford leadership, giving the chilling message it sends to the serious science faculty slash students. Therefore, I hope the Stanford president reconsiders and instead focuses his attention on the important scientific po projects underway on his campus and not this nonsense. And he says, details of the damage from such anti-science views are detailed in my recent book published by Johns Hopkins University Press. And his book is there, The Deadly Rise of Anti-Science. <laughs> Um, okay, so what is he flipping out about? He's flipping out about this Stanford Symposium. This is, let me just show you from it. They're putting this on in October and they've just announced that they're doing this. The Stanford president is gonna be speaking at this symposium as well as many other experts, all of them experts for the most part um, in, their, in their respective field. And Peter Hotez, Dr. Peter Hotez is freaking out about this. So one of the sessions is session one, evidence-based decision-making during a pandemic. So they're going to be exploring, they're saying the, in, the interventions undertaken to control the COVID-19 pandemic, lockdowns, extended school closures, social distancing, mask mandates, vaccine mandates were unprecedented in their scope and global impact. How well did these policies work to protect the public from COVID-19 and what were their collateral harms? How can scientists better inform pandemic policy in real time during the next pandemic. And the people on this panel are a professor of health policy for Stanford, professor of medicine at University of California, San Francisco, chief of islet transplant surgery, Johns Hopkins, former Swedish state epidemiologist, Anders Tegnell. He was in charge of the Swedish response that received massive amounts of criticism, but then ultimately ended up being the best response. Uh, by the way, if you don't know the Swedish numbers, if you remember, Sweden was demonized. Anders Tegnell was in charge as the epidemiologist. He was their Anthony Fauci and Barbara and uh, Deborah Burks. 
and they ultimately they decided not to do all the lockdowns they instead and they didn't do school closures they instead tried their best to protect the elderly in the nursing homes and they let everybody else live their lives and they just said just take some precautions that was largely demonized sweden of all places which is more of a socialist country it's a socialist capitalist you know it's got a lot of social safety nets uh, they were demonized as a libertarian's dream, <laughs> which made no sense whatsoever if you know about Sweden's uh, economic policies. And the and the people there are very liberal. But nonetheless, you know, they were called, oh, a libertarian's dream. And all of these people, the Democrats and, and leftists, just completely eviscerated Sweden over it. Well, in the and then Sweden had some spikes of COVID in 2020. They saw uh, some excess deaths in 2020, mostly in their nursing homes. People were pointing at Sweden and saying, Sweden, see, they're a cautionary tale. Look at what happened. They didn't do all the lockdowns like their neighboring Nor Norwegian, you know, Norway, um, their, their neighboring Scandinavian countries, Norway, Denmark, Finland. Those countries did the harsh lockdowns like the rest of Europe, and they had low COVID deaths in 2020. And look at Sweden. This is a cautionary tale. Fast forward. Now, Anders Tegnell said, the epidemiologist in, in charge of Sweden said, wait three years and then we'll find out how this how this response panned out but you can't judge us based on these spikes right now these are expected wait three years and let's just see how everybody fares and guess what sweden won in the end three years when you look back at it uh yes it's true that sweden had a spike in 2020 it was a quick spike more excess deaths however in 2022 Finland, Denmark, Norway saw a rise in their excess deaths. And not only were there, did they have excess deaths that Sweden at that point did not have, but those three countries had a longer spike of excess deaths than Sweden had when Sweden had their initial spike and then it was over. The other Nordic countries had a longer, they had to endure a longer period of time of excess deaths in 2022. They're all cause mortality was higher than Sweden's. Sweden's is the lowest in the entire European region. Sweden has the lowest all-cause mortality now uh, because they weren't killing people with depression and suicide and cancers because people were still able to go to the doctor. People had, their their lives were fine. They had nice, you know, they had mental health and because they weren't, they weren't depressed, they weren't under lockdown. So Sweden in the end saw a, they ultimately ended up with a better outcome of course, nobody in the news is talking about it. Are we getting any apologies from all of those people? Is Anders Tegnell, he does, he's do a lot of apologies. Is anybody apologizing to him and saying, sorry about demonizing Sweden? It turns out your response was correct. No, of course not. They're not saying that his response was correct. They're instead freaking out. You got Peter Otez, Dr. Peter Otez saying, oh my gosh, these anti-science people are coming to Stanford, they're gonna have these conversations and this is really bad. This is really bad for the pro-science group, even though Anders Tegnell's actual data is legitimate and better than anything that Peter Hotez was advocating for. Uh, so they go on in this, they've got a, another group of people speaking. They're gonna talk about pandemic policy from a global perspective. Because the world economy is global in scope, pandemic policy decisions made by Western governments had profound impacts on the health and economic prospects of people worldwide, including the collapse of global markets, severe supply chain disruptions, chain disruptions, large-scale government borrowing to finance pandemic policies and global inflation. How can the interests of the world's poor be better represented in the decisions of Western governments during the next pandemic? Fair enough to talk about, oh no, how dare they? Uh, you've got the applied medical anthropologist from the University of Washington speaking, also a professor of theoretical epidemiology from Oxford, Oxford, professor of law from the University of Chicago, professor of medicine from UC San, San Francisco. Oh, yeah, but look at this anti-science panel. They then want to talk about misinformation, censorship, and academic freedom. Um, and they're going to talk about how there was this crackdown by the government on you know censoring people that had differing opinions censoring people that was that were actually showcasing the data calling people like myself conspiracy theorists right they're going to talk about this and they've got a variety of other people speaking at that event some journalists they also have a litigator they then also are going to be talking about pandemic policy from a global perspective so talking about how the world economy 
Um, actually, sorry, I just we, we just did that one. Okay, they're also going to be talking about COVID nineteen origins and the regulation of virology. So talking about um, things like um, gain of function research and whether or not they should be doing that. But Peter Hotez just totally freaking out about this. Cannot believe it. Saying this is just anti science. This is th these these viewpoints of these people are the ones that caused thousands of deaths. How could he possibly say that with a straight face when now we know that lockdowns caused an immense amount of harm, especially on the youth? Young people, they're now saying, there are studies that have come out. Brown University just came out with a study saying that today's young people are now going to have lower IQs. They're gonna have lower IQs they're also going to be, uh, they said that the lockdowns, mandates, and other restrictions are likely to create a generation of children with lower IQs and signs of social brain damage. Social brain damage from the pandemic, from the lockdowns. Uh, people were wearing masks. How can kids learn facial expressions? And uh, I mean, we basically have, have created a generation of sociopaths that aren't gonna be able to read human emotion and they're eventually gonna be in charge. You know, they're gonna grow up. They're gonna be the generation in charge of us. Also, um, th they said that clo closures contributed to increased anxiety, loneliness, and stress. And children who were born during the pandemic have significantly reduced verbal, motor, and overall cognitive performance compared to children born pre-pandemic. And that was all because of, that's all because of the the lockdowns, the mandates, the mask wearing, all of that affected the kids. They're also low on the test scores. They don't know as much. They're not as smart when they graduate right now. They're not they, because they don't have as much information because they lost a lot of years and in information during that time. And what is wrong with looking back at that and speaking the truth and saying, here's the truth of what your response, Dr. Peter Hotez, the one that you advocated for on, on mainstream news nearly every day advocating for this, these are the harms that your tactics caused. And yet he wants to still call it anti-science and still wants to have it censored in some way. He's saying he doesn't really want it censored. He's, he's not against the event happening. He just doesn't think the president of Stanford should go and speak at it and legitimize it. He has a problem with it being legitimized, which is the same, that is censorship. That is a form of censorship. Um, Jay Bhattacharya, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, who is at Stanford, he says that he would be delighted to invite Dr. Peter Hotez to speak at the conference on pandemic management. The purpose is to promote civil scientific discussion from many points of view. Jay also went on to say that um, he, well, he indicated that he's blocked by Dr. Peter Hotez <laughs> on Twitter. So he said, if anybody who's not blocked could pass this message along, you know, we'd like to extend this invitation to Dr. Peter Hotez to come out and actually speak at this symposium. Of course, Dr. Peter Hotez will not. He wouldn't even debate for gobs and gobs of money for his, um, you know, gobs of money for his, uh, for a charity of choice. You know, he refused to, to do that. So I doubt he's gonna go speak at this symposium. Instead, he's gonna make a lot of money off of books, continuing to fear monger and continuing to let people feel like their, their ideas, their lockdowns, the masks, the endless, demonizing of people who didn't want to take the vaccine. Uh, he's going to continue to write books and make a bunch of money off of spreading that narrative rather than the truth, rather than looking at the data, rather than looking at the truth, rather than hearing out others who uh, who have different points of view and actually, and just the truth now, the truth from what happened during the pandemic. So um, still at it. I mean, that's what's so sad about all of this is that these guys are still at it. You know, they just have, I, I just thought by now, I mean, it's just ridiculous that by now, by now, you know, here we are years later and they can't look at the data and realize they were just totally and utterly and completely wrong is what they were. Hey guys, this was just a clip of a longer show. Catch the full show by going to KimIversonShow.com. It is free. It airs Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. You could go back now and watch this full interview. I highly recommend it. Again, go to KimIversonShow.com. Thank you so much for watching.